Uh, next up is Tara Fuller, Fuller with California State Parks. She has her MS and BS from Cal Poly Humboldt, and she is a senior environmental scientist with State Parks. She'll be talking about thatch management using mowing and grazing to benefit the Barron's Endangered Butterfly yeah, in Manchester, California. Tara. I think this is the big arrow and I'm gonna go for the big arrow. Hi, thank you so much. Um, good morning and I appreciate Northern California botanists um, inviting me to present today. And I just wanna also say I'm really thankful for this opportunity to talk about some monitoring data that we collected looking at some techniques. And I also wanna um, put a plug in the California um, native grassland um, booth over there. I, I found them midstream in this project and they were a really great resource. All right, let's see. Big, oh, there we go. Okay. Um, so a little bit about our butterfly that's, it's federally endangered and it was endangered, designated endangered in 1997. The historic range was from Mendocino to Salt Point and the current range is from Manchester State Park to Salt Point. The main um, location of occupancy is on the BLM Stornetta property, and there's scattered occurrences um, on parks property at Manchester and Salt Point. There are two similar subspecies, um, the Myrtles to the south in Sonoma, and to the north, the Oregon. So a little bit about that life history of the butterfly. It emerges in early to mid-summer. Um, it immediately tries to find nectar plants. These are important for energy and egg development. And again, it's emerging in September. This isn't really our peak flowering season. So you can see already there's some challenges for the um, butterfly. It mates immediately. The males usually emerge first. The ovaries take about a month to mature. And then they lay their eggs on or near blue violets. They can actually, there is evidence that they can smell the violets even if there's no above ground matter. Um, the larvae overwinter without feeding, and then they go through approximately six molts, and then they reemerge uh, two to three weeks again in the late um, summer. We know most of our knowledge about barons from a lot of the work they've done on Oregon silver spot. So we've been very lucky that they have done a lot of research up there. So many of you are a botanist. I am not, but I'm, um, so go easy on me. But um, there is Viola adunca is the host plant. And many of you probably know um, Viola adunca is a host plant for many fritillary species. So it's an important um, plant. Um, and it takes a lot of leaves and plants to support one caterpillar. They've done some research and it takes about 200 leaves or 25 plants per meter. And, and, the, and the, what's really unique is the caterpillar has no way to really find um, the plant. So it kind of just wanders through space and then it like runs into a viola and this is like, ooh, I wanna eat this. So it doesn't have any olfactory mechanisms that we know of at this point to find the plant. So it really does need a high, you know, high density number of plants. Um, this is a perennial herb, which is good in a perennial grassland. Um, it spreads by woody rhizomes and seed, and it locally occupies vernally mo moist meadows, prairies, stream banks, and the ed um, edges of conifers. So a little bit about Manchester State Park. If you've never been there, it's very beautiful. Um, Pre-contact, it was home to the Central Pomo Indians, now recognized as the Manchester Band of Pomo Indians. Um, early settler, settlers did cultivation on ranching on the um, property. And in 1930, the State Park Commission set aside the beach. And through a series of acquisitions, it became whole in 1991. So it's still a relatively you know, new park. But what is really amazing about Manchester, it has about 5,700 acres of dunes, prairies, coastal scrub, freshwater wetlands, riparian and estuaries, and contains seven endangered um, or threatened species. So it's a very important home to many listed um, animals. So why restoration? Um, we have these prairies that look super beautiful. They're like blowing in the wind and they're golden. 
Um, but basically, they have been really impacted by historic agricultural activities, loss of fire, loss of grazers, non-native grasses, you name it. And this has really affected the, has resulted in ecological changes to the prairie. Um, we have invasive perennial grasses that compete for resources um, through space, sunlight, water, and through the dense accumulation of thatch. And barren silver spots are basically low to absent at Manchester. So they're very rare at this point, and we wanted to kind of, um, working with our working group, kind of look at opportunities and to maybe improve the prairie. And we had two locations at Manchester that, um, that contained Viola dunca, so it was really easy to kind of split those two locations and look at treatments. And mowing and grazing has been a tool to help control invasive grasses. This is documented in the literature. It is do documented in the recovery plan for the butterfly. So in 2015, we got some initial funding from recovery funding from our local Arcata office at US Fish and Wildlife Service. And then we got some more funding through the Disney Conservation Fund, which really allowed us to um, keep going with our treatments and monitoring. So we had a pretty simple question, right? This isn't a PhD, this isn't my master's thesis. We just wanted to know, does grazing or mowing reduce thatch numbers um, and reduce thatch and increase viola? So in 2015 and 2016, we implemented treatments and um, we did 20 acres of mode and 20 acres of grazing. Those are those large polygons that you see on the map. And then we did 10, 10 acres of control, which were immediately adjacent. And what you're seeing also on the map is where the lines are. Those are our, um, our, our um, butterfly monitoring survey transects. Our violas, which are the stars, are immediately hovering those transects. And then we have some dots that are associated with the Robel pole monitoring we did. Um, and so what we really looked at is mowing and grazing during the spring or summer or fall or winter, but we mostly implemented fall and winter, and I'll go into those reasons. Um, and additionally, with some of that funding that we received from Disney, we, in, we implemented a similar project at Salt Point State Park using um, cattle as our grazers. And so because we had so many activities going on and so many things, we created a chart that we basically keep, keep track of to today for all our activities. I think it's really important. I get confused and you know, you gotta kinda know what did I do, when, and there's a lot going on. So our monitoring, um, we did some pre-project initial monitoring. We just did an initial viola account. Um, Renee Pasquinelli here in the audience helped me. Peter Warner, our consulting biologist, we went out and we did some pre-project um, viola counts. Um, we, did, we maintained our, butter, our butterfly survey effort. And again, we had these transects since 2007. I'm not gonna report on these da this data because we basically only had a few detections during 2007 and only one during the treatment period. Um, we used um, Robel pole to, ma um, to measure thatch density. It's an optical measurement to like get centimeters in height. So I'm just gonna show some pictures of being state parks. We get to take a lot of pictures and they've really come, come in handy to kind of go, what did I do and when did I do it? Um, so I really like pictures and I think it helps to tell the story. So this is the control mowing site. Um, most of these pictures are in May because this is when we were out doing the viola counts. Um, and you can see the built up of thatch, the really dense grass, and this is what the, the mowing site looked like. So here's along the line. I like the line pictures because you can really see the control with that thatch and dead grass. And then we treated this um, in the fall. And then now it's starting to um, grow in the spring. So this is after a fall mowing. And our mowing um, area had a little bit more native seed bank and geophytes. And it was just, and, and it had some native bunch grasses. So it, um, our California tufted hair grass seemed to really respond to the mowing. And so did um, invasive, I mean, not invasive, non-native and native forbs. So this is what our control um, grazing looked like. Again, you can just really see it looks really dense, a lot of thatch, and this is in the spring. And so it's not even in its full height. And it, it just hadn't had any disturbance. And there is a line with our control and our graze again. And this is after a summer grazing. So it wasn't even the year before grazing. It was 
um, a summer grazing, and then uh, this is what it looks like in April. So after our fall grazing, um, I, I wanted to show this, this picture here because this was in a wet year. We were really lucky to have um, a number of wet years. This was really important because we had kind of come out of a drought, <laughs> and droughts are kind of challenging for any Forbes. Um, and so it was just, it was really good to have some water on the landscape. And the wet areas seemed to respond really well. Um, we end up getting some blue eye grass that we really never had seen. Um, some harlequin locusts, um, some butter, um, buttercups, and just uh, you know a few native plants that popped up. So again, we have really simple results. Um, we basically did viola counts, and um, what you can see is overall is an increase in the number of um, violas through the, the study period for five years. And um, what you can see is that the numbers overall increased. We um, think this was a result of detection probability. The same surveyor was basically doing the counts in the same areas. Um, but you can see a, um, a very big difference between the relative and absolute um, change for both the grazing and the mowing treatments versus the controls. So our optical density monitoring um, wasn't super exciting when we looked at the, the result. It was a lot of, there was a lot of variation. And basically what it says, if you basically graze or mow um, in the spring, then you're gonna have short grass in September, <laughs> which isn't really that exciting. Um, it's not really that surprising. The grass didn't grow within a couple months. But, um, but what was interesting is we were out there walking, all of us, not just myself, and we could see a difference in the thatch, especially after a number of years of treatments. And this technique just didn't either pick that up or it just, we didn't have enough sample, um, uh, sample points to you know, pick up that level of change. But it, optically, it looked like there was a difference and it, it definitely felt like a difference walking through the grass. Um, and this is just a picture of the technique. Again, okay, yeah, we put it the, on the fall and spring. We did two treatments in the fall and one that spring, and the grass is really short. And then we put them all in the fall, and by the, that summer, the grass is really tall, and then the control on the bottom. So this is just illustrating what I was saying. So I generally, we have some monitoring cl conclusions, is that viola numbers did increase both of the grazing and mowing. The dead thatch was removed with annual treatments. Um, however, only spring-summer treatments reduced the density of grass during the barren's flight season. Um, and this was using the Robel pole method. However, observationally, like I just said, um, there appeared to be a carryover effect, especially with re repeated years of treatments. So I get to walk around a lot, and so I carry around a list of observations all the time. And um, in the fall and winter, treatments reduced the grass thatch, thatch through the spring and early summer and lasted through the um, viola blooming season. So you could do a treatment in the fall or winter, and it would carry over through that spring's viola season. So it was a really great time um, to do this treatment. The native forbs and native grasses um, showed a response in areas that we observed where the seed bank was present. However, in 2019, we, um, we were lucky enough to have Mendocino County flown with LIDAR. And with this data to the map, you can see um, that the historic tilling lines really popped up from the previous um, land management that had occurred in the 40s or the 60s. This is one foot LIDAR. So again, really looking at your LIDAR data can kind of help maybe tell a story. So the truth is we don't really have a native seed bank present. Um, so, and the other observation that kind of came from all this is that uh, purple velvet grass appeared to be reduced, although we weren't specifically measuring it, um, by the mowing of gra by and grazing. However, the bent grass still seemed to really respond to it. So we're mowing it and now we're getting um, a grass is stoloniferous or capillaris and you know, it's a rhizomous grass. I, this is, I don't know if I'm trading one that's better, probably worse. So anyways, if this is gonna be a long-term management challenge. So monitoring conclusions. Um, oops, sorry, wrong one. Recommendations, so um, as a land manager, I'm trying to look at where do I go from here? What are my steps? How would I do this in maybe other places? And grazing and mowing are thatch reduction techniques and, and can improve the flowering of natives. We have some coastal prairies that are relatively intact, 
and however still have holcus on the fringes and they're kind of um, increasing into our native air areas we're going to be looking at mowing um, specifically because it's easy to move around to treat these areas and monitor these areas with some disturbance again putting a disturbance back on the landscape for perennial grasses fall treatments will last until the spring early summer blooming season so this is a really nice time to do we do a lot of our vegetation management in the fall um, because it avoided the bird nesting season. I know that maybe seems kind of, but we have to manage all these other species that are present. And the other thing is, um, it didn't impact the spring, summer, and forb. So we weren't putting, we're not gonna put the mower out and then mow whatever is blooming in the, in the, uh, during the butterflies flight season. And I'm, on, I'm ready for questions. So the farmed and tilled grasslands will likely remove, will need something more aggressive than just treatment alone. And we have some upcoming funding that will help um, maybe facilitate um, doing um, a bare earth treatment. I just wanna say thank you um, to everybody that had really helped for US Fish and Wildlife Service, the Arcata office kind of looking um, outside the box. Um, Florida University and the Dizzy Conservation Fund, our state park team, past and present, um, and our consulting bot um, botanist, Peter Warner. Again, it really takes a lot of people, and I also want to bring out the heavy equipment operators. It's not usually just the biologist that makes restoration happen. It takes a lot of other team players. So thank you, and I don't know if I have any time for questions, but I do, it sounds like. See any questions? Uh, <laughs> Thank, great talk, Tara. I, I've actually asked you this before, but I think everybody would like to know the answer. The uh, mowing height, um, wh what was the mowing height and did you change the mowing height with season? No, we did not. We had a, basically a one um, mower that did five inches. We just purchased another mo uh, mower that can really adjust it for different invasive species, but it was five inches and that was to kind of reduce any impacts to the viola and that was our, our general mowing height was five inches. Hi. Hi. Is there any way that fire management could be integrated into your program or not? Um, well, we, we pay for our grazer right now, so I, I mean, I think it's a way that we can support our local grazers. Um, you know, Leland works on um, down south in Sonoma, and it just is a way, again, to kind of build these relationships, but we are paying our grazers. So it's not free grazing, because they're doing rotational grazing, which is very um, labor intensive. They have to move the paddock every few days, provide electric fencing, move their water, um, so I don't know if I totally, um, but we do, it is local um, grazers that are working with us. Are you talking about fire management? Yeah, so fire, oh, fire management. So um, I had a, um, a note about um, fire and, you know, we are looking into prescribed fire, um, but we have seven endangered animal species and so it's very much a challenge. And U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service wasn't really ready to say, like, hey, go torch it. Um, so, I, I, and I'm just being honest. These are the things that we have to navigate through as a land manager. And so what we, we did the things we can do. I think the nice thing about grazing and mowing, it's a great interim tool between burning. So if you can't burn, you know, there's some papers out there that show the results of prescribed fire last about five years. But, but mowing is somewhat of a surrogate in grazing, so you can kind of integrate those. And I also would say that the mowing is a great pre-treatment prior to um, actually doing prescribed fire because it gives a really great mosaic of fuels. And so I'd really recommend before you're gonna burn a prairie is to really maybe look at some pre-treatments. But we are doing more fire. We're currently uh, burning in the dunes, so it's exciting. I have a quick question. Um, with the, I'm here. Um, with the mowing, did you remove the clippings or did you l let them broadcast onto the onto the ground? Yeah, we just let them mulch on site. Okay. Yeah. One we, more question. We had a question online. Um, 
What was the grazing period, and can you speculate how the viola would respond if the grazing period were six months, fall through winter? Um, well, I, I think, you know, I look to our grazer to kind of help answer questions about grazing regime. Um, we did fall, and I'm hoping I'm going to answer all this right, because most of the time, because it was easy. And I like the thing about rotational grazing, because what it does, it doesn't really allow them to select. So if you're just having the, the grazers out on the landscape, they can really select for what they want. And so, you know, we were really looking for the hoof action, the grazing, because our, our prairie was in such poor shape, they weren't really eating it very well. In fact, the cattle grazers at Salt Point, which were much more, um, which are much more um, effective and efficient grazers for grasses, I would recommend. So I don't know what the impact would be. I think if you, you definitely would want to get them off probably before like March. Um, so again, the violas can then, um, most of our violas are below ground. We hardly ever see them above ground, but at Stornenda they do have them kind of blooming throughout the year. But it, it's been very successful in Stornetta using just regular um, grazing. So thank you.